Haley Witherspoon from South Carolina, who talks about edge maximal separable UDGs in the plane. All right, thank you. I just want to start off by um, thanking Dr. Nathanson for organizing this conference. It's been great to get to attend this week. Um, I'm very impressed that you managed to fit over 100 of us in the schedule. Um, and it's an exciting day for me. I've done a few undergrad conference talks, but this is my first professional conference. So on that note, I just want to say thank you to my collaborators and mentors, Drs. Joshua Cooper and Michael Filicetta for their support and their patience as we worked on this together. All right. So first things first, our study of edge maximal separable unit distance graphs was motivated by work that we originally started on, on the chromatic number of the plane. And the chromatic number of the plane is the smallest integer k so that is possible to k color the entire plane so that no pair of points at unit distance from each other receive the same color. So you'll also hear people talk about um, forbidding monochromatic unit distances, and that's the same thing. So just to point out in relation to the last talk, this is different from the achromatic number of the plane. Um, so over here on the left, as soon as we have one vertex, we know that's chromatic number one. And then by the time we have a triangle, we're up to three. And then with the Moser spindle, we have that the chromatic number of the plane is at least four. And then on the far right, this hexagonal tiling with seven colors shows that it's possible to color the plane with seven colors while avoiding monochromatic unit distances. So the diameter of each of these hexagons is one. And then we have um, the borders opposite each other. One of them has to be open or else we end up with a monochromatic unit distance. So pretty quickly after the question was originally posed by Edward Nelson in 1950, um, we, we had these two bounds. We knew that it was at least four and at most seven. But in 2018, Aubrey de Grey, who uh, he's actually a gerontologist, his main research is in longevity, but he just does graph theory stuff on the side for fun. He showed that the chromatic number of the plane is at least five with this 1,581 vertex graph that I have in the middle. And then since then, the past few years, a polymath project has been able to come up with a non four colorable um, unit distance graph with only 510 vertices. So we've had some strong improvement just in the past few years on that. All right, so you may have noticed in the little animation that I have on the left, um, that the kite subgraph is really instrumental, this graph that I've got on the right. Um, we've been calling the two yellow vertices in this graph a forced pair, because in a three coloring, the top vertex, which is shared between these two kites on the Moser spindle, it determined the color of the vertex opposite it in the first kite. And then we had to introduce that fourth color because the um, vertex opposite the top yellow vertex normally would have determined, normally would have been determined by that top yellow vertex. So you might say, well, what's the point in looking at the Moser spindle after Aubrey de Grey already gave us his non four colorable subgraph? But the answer to that is that his graph was essentially built on rotated copies of the Moser spindle and the seven vertex wheel. So this is really still relevant. So our next task was to get more of these graphs with forced pairs. So we set out to generate lists of edge maximal unit distance graphs on a given number of vertices. So we expressed our unit distance constraints as a system of polynomials, and then we used computational algebra to try to find embeddings of these graphs. But we ran into problems pretty quickly. We have that if any graph is non-rigid, we end up with just an insane amount of embeddings. And then if it, even if a graph is rigid, the variety corresponding to embeddings of a rigid graph is three-dimensional. And then we have a little bit of hope thinking that we can mod out by the, by the isometries of the plane and get a zero-dimensional variety corresponding to finitely many embeddings of each graph. But then when we alter our system of polynomials to reflect that change, to reflect that we just want finitely many embeddings of each graph, we just have complete combinatorial explosion anywhere past like six or seven vertex graphs. So what can we do to reduce our search base to the point that it's manageable to it, something that we can, we can get our hands on? So we can limit our search to just finite edge maximal unit distance graphs or subgraphs of the unit distance graph, since we can build any graph from finite edge maximal components. And then we can divide our set of all edge maximal unit distance graphs even further, looking at biconnectedness and rigidity. So it's a couple new terms there. Um, if we say that a graph is biconnected, that just means that we had, we'd have to remove two vertices in order to disconnect the graph, so to break it into two separate pieces. And then the rigidity idea we're using here, there's a lot under the hood, but it's fairly intuitive. It's just that in the particular graph embedding that we're looking at, we can't like wiggle any individual vertex or any individual vertex without breaking um, unit distance edges other places in graph. So first, finding the biconnected graphs like the Moser spindle, um, it's it's the most computationally simple task that we have here. So we're not we're not too worried about that. But then we have this weird case of biconnected non-rigid graphs. Um, so something like this, where we have this string of I think it's eleven vertices in the middle, and we can have this little bit of movement in this inner port 
portion of the triangular lattice that I have drawn. Um, and we haven't given too much attention to this quite yet because it really, it's just a mess. There's all kinds of crazy things happening with these graphs. And then as the title suggested, most importantly for our talk today, um, we have this particularly simple case of non-rigidity, which is separable graphs, because any separable, gra separable graph has to be non-rigid. We can rotate um, any two biconnected components among or about their cut vertex. We have non-rigidity there. And this type of graph is really what's interesting to us. So I've given one of the simplest examples right here. We have just a six wheel with this spoke. So we have two components attached, and then we can rotate the spoke freely while preserving all of our unit distances and while preserving maximality. So that's, that's really what's key here. Um, there's no place to rotate this degree one vertex so that it's distance one from another vertex without completely destroying the injectivity of the embedding. And we want injective embeddings. So on that note, we know pretty quickly that any finite separable edge maximal unit distance graph includes at least the six wheel. So if we have two graph components, just um, two unit distances, so we've just got three vertices so far, and one of them shared, then we can rotate one of them about the origin until the angle between the two is 60 degrees in whatever embedding we're dealing with. And then there's this unit distance edge between the two, which is a contradiction of maximality unless that edge was already included in the first graph component. So we can build the entire six wheel, um, repeating that process of rotating the two uh, by connected components in relation to each other and arriving at a contradiction of maximality unless those vertices are already in the graph. So before we move on, it's worth noting here that the distance of any of the wheel vertices from the origin, these hexagon vertices, is one, which seems pretty simple right now, but we're going to refer to this as um, the radius of the vertex. So the radius of any of the uh, six wheel vertices is one, and that's that's more important as we move Theorem, our main result, we see by the same maximality argument that I used for um, the six wheel that any vertex on our graph has to be at least distance or a distance from the origin, which allows us to construct unit distances between our first vertex and then any other vertices um, between the first vertex. Sorry, start that over. We, we have our six wheel. Um, and then any other vertex has to be at a radius, which allows us to construct unit distances between this first vertex and any other vertices at that radii, so that we eventually come back to the vertex we started at. So for the six wheel, we just have to go around once by rotating around that picture. But we'll allow vertices um, at radii, which require the winding number of this path of unit coordinates around the origin to be greater than one. So it's okay if we have to loop around um, like even three times, as long as we come back to where we started. All we really need is for the process to terminate because we did say we're talking about finite graphs here. So we have this constraint on the possible radii of our vertices, but we also need to be able to zigzag back and forth between a set of vertices at one radius and a set of vertices at another radius whenever those um, radii are within one of each other. Um, and we need to be able to do that in a way that terminates. So we need to be able to zigzag back and forth between these sets of vertices in a way that eventually comes back to where we started or else we, have, we don't have finite graphs um, for the same reason as with the radius constraint. So that's a lot of stuff that I've thrown out to you so far. These concepts um, of having all of our vertices at certain radii and then also being able to zigzag back and forth are, are pretty central to the rest of our work on this. So we're gonna um, encapsulate these in just a few new terms that I've got here. So first, we're gonna set up this idea of gonality by saying that a real number R is gonal if r equals one over two sine pi over x for x a positive rational. So this really is just the radius of a regular polygon with side length one and x sides. So if x is six, we get the hexagon and r is one. And you'll notice here that we define x um, as a rational and not as an integer. So this is exactly what I was getting at when I was talking about it being okay to have a winding number that's greater than one. Um, if we have one of these rational polygons that I've got pictured here, um, our, our winding number is going to be greater than one. So we're going to go ahead and define the p over q gon as a graph constructed by plotting the p roots of unity and the complex plane, and then connecting every q vertices. So each of the edges that you see going across the circle here, those are all unit distance. So this is really a unit distance graph. All right. And our second constraint that I had on the previous slide, um, the zigzag business that I was talking about, hopefully is a little bit clearer with this picture, 
it really is just coming from the law of cosines. So we say that two real numbers, R and Q, are cogonal if they satisfy this kind of twist on the law of cosines for some positive rational Z. So the positive rational Z here is talking about the angle between our um, segment of length R and our segment of length Q. And then the part that makes these two radii cogonal is that we can construct this um, unit distance that I have shown in the dotted line here um, for some angle, which is a positive rational multiple of pi. All right. So just to get a couple of examples here before we move on, um, here, moving from the outside in, we have a dodecagon, a 12-gon, and then two hexagons rotated, and then a 12 fifths gon. So we see that the radius of points on the dodecagon here, and that radius is shown in orange, and the radius of points on the hexagon, and that radius is shown in green. And they're both gonal numbers, since they we can make this polygon of unit side length. Um, and then they're also cogonal, as we can see with this scaling triangle that I have in the middle. So just to make sure we're completely on the same page, I have it here again, but split up. So on the left, this shows that the hexagon is cogonal to the dodecagon. The unit distance is shown in green here. And then on the right, I have that the 12 fifths gon is cogonal to the hexagon. So in case it was a little bit trickier to picture um, the rational case, we have that shown here. Okay. So to just put this all in one place, just kind of build it all into one definition, we're going to call the graph Q of S, the unit distance graph composed of S gons for every S in the set S, and which has the minimal number and the middle and the minimal number of their rotate so that any point on a circle with one of the corresponding radii at distance one from a vertex is also a vertex. So this is working in our maximality constraints without, without saying that explicitly. All right, so if my number theorists in the room have tuned out, this is your moment to tune back in. We have this nice um, Diophantine problem that, that comes out of this geometric question. And so here at this point, we're gonna ask what sets S give rise to finite graphs Q of S. So this amounts to asking for rational solutions S and Z to our cogonality equation, to this law of cosines twist that we have here. And we, we don't say anything about Y quite yet because we're gonna give, um, why whenever we're trying to solve this problem. So as an example, just as the simplest example that we have for the hexagon, y equals six, um, and so q equals one. And so things simplify pretty well um, just to this equation that I have at the bottom here. And so with a little bit of Galois theory here, we can show that if y is six, if we're looking at the hexagon, then s can be six, 10, or 12. So the six there just tells us that the, that the hexagon is cogonal to itself. And then we also know that the hexagon is cogonal to both the decagon and the dodecagon. And then we also consider um, polygons corresponding to our Galois conjugates here. So the hexagon is also cogonal to the 10 thirds gon and the 12 fifths gon. So at this point, we set out to find what could be cogonal to the decagon and the dodecagon. So originally, this is all we needed to do to try to um, see how far out from the origin we needed to step with these graphs. Uh, but we found that the radius of the decagon, this Q sub 10 here, is actually cogonal to the radius of the 15 gon. So we needed to find all solutions to our cogonality equation, that law of cosines um, twist that I have up there, all, all solutions to this Diophantine problem for y equals 6, for y equals 10, for y equals 12, and for y equals 15. And we want one process that's going to work in every case. And before I move on, this is just one little neat detail. This Q sub 10, the radius of the decagon, it's, it's the golden ratio. All right, so like we saw on the last slide, the radii corresponding to these polygons are really messy. Lots of roots, nested roots even. Um, so our next step is just to rewrite our original problem, our cogonality equation without fractions. So we can do that by denoting um, the sine of pi over s by u. And then let's just throw in y equals 10 as an example. Uh, just for our purposes. So we can see that things are getting messy again because we're throwing in our Q sub 10, which is messy. Um, but if we multiply it on both sides by its conjugate, then we get this nice um, polynomial in the integers or in integer coefficients here. So it looks a little bit nicer at this point, but now what, right? So shifting a little bit back towards the geometric question, we know that the absolute value of T is at most one just by the way it was defined um, as cosine of two pi over z. 
So we can find bounds on u just by employing techniques from calculus. This is a pretty simple step here. All we need to do is consider the Lagrange multiplier problem of minimizing u under the given constraints that come from uh, the coganality equation in the geometry. So here are our bounds on u. And we started out with bounds that I have here on the right, just given by computer estimate. But to allow ourselves to use exact arithmetic, we extended our lower bounds just a little bit in acquiring these rational lower bounds that I have on the left. So all this is great, but what would really tell us something about the geometry is bounds on something related to S, because S was how we defined our, our polygons, like a um, six gone would be for S is six. So let's go ahead and write um, one over S as A over N here, where A and N are positive integers and they are relatively prime. And then we'll define two over Z as B over M, where B and M are also positive integers, which are relatively prime. Um, and then we know too that we can write our sine of pi over S and our cosine of two pi over Z in terms of roots of unity. So here we have just zeta as the four N M root of unity coming again from how we redefined one over S and two over Z. And then at this point, rewriting our coganality equation in terms of zeta gives us a vanishing sum of roots of unity. Um, and just as an interesting little connection here, John Conway actually put out a paper on how to solve these in general, but we don't need anything quite as heavy duty as what he did here. All right. So using some of the divis some divisibility constraints implied indirectly by our definition of M and N, we just apply an automorphism to the um, coganality equations, which, which sends our original sine of pi A over N to plus or minus sine pi D over N where um, D can only be one or two. So this, this narrows things down a good bit. This is a key step in acquiring our bounds um, because now we, can now we can relate our bounds on U to N. And we know that our sine pi D over N is small whenever N is large. So we now have lower bounds on sine, or we now have lower bounds on sine two pi over N and that gives upper bounds on N itself. So I have those in the table here. And this is getting us a good bit closer um, to the geometric result again. So we've got n taken care of using that automorphism was our big step here. And now we just have one more um, loose end to tie up before we get to our, our main result on, on those unit distance graphs I mentioned at the beginning. So what about m, right? We defined um, one over s as a over n and then two over z as b over m. And that two pi over z is really important here because that's what allows the different radii to be cogonal to each other. That's what tells us that there is some angle where we can make this unit distance. So making, making use of this result that I have up here on cyclotomic fields, we're gonna go ahead and write one more um, new variable here, m prime, as the least common multiple of 2m and 4n divided by 4n. So then you've got some more divisibility stuff coming back in here, some more properties of cyclotomic fields that we make use of. But then we can con consider the degree of this extension that I have um, just the rationals that join the four and m prime root of unity over the rationals that join the four n root of unity. And we know that that um, is a upper bound on the totient of m prime. And so pulling all this together, we have a good set of uh, constraints on both m and n. And so um, we can move back towards um, s and z again. So like I said, with just a little bit more work, we can use these bounds um, and restrictions on M and N to get a finite set of S and Z values for each of our four Y's. So we started out just with Y equals six, and then we added Y equals 10, Y equals 12. And then because um, the radius of the 10 gone was cogonal to that of the 15 gone, we also include Y equals 15 here. So yeah, the Y gives the number of sides of our first polygon, and then the S gives the number of sides of the polygon cogonal to that. And then the Z corresponds to the angle between um, the two radii, the angle at which we need to rotate copies of these polygons in order to achieve coganality. And admittedly, at this point, our final result wouldn't be nearly as satisfying if we really had this many possible configurations of edge maximal separable unit distance graphs. But the good news is we can remove a few entries from this table. So here in blue, I have entries in the table which just tell us that polygons are cogonal to themselves. So of course, the hexagon is cogonal to itself because we can make these unit distances that really are just the, the side lengths of the polygon. And then the same goes for the other three. And then we can also remove um, the entries that I have here in orange, 
because they're just redundant. So if we've already said in the y equals six case that the hexagon is cogonal to the decagon, then it makes no difference to say that the decagon is cogonal to the hexagon in the y equals 10 case. So it all comes down to just this set. You just have six pairs of polygons whose radii are within one of each other, which can coexist in a finite edge maximal separable unit distance graph. So in any other case, we, we have um, contradiction, contradictions of maximality or we end up with infinite graphs. So these are the ones that we can use to make finite edge maximal separable unit distance graphs. And at this point, even looking, looking more towards the geometry, we can corral things a little bit more because, um, for example, the, the radius of the 12 gone, the dodecagon, is more than one away from the radius of the 12 fifths gone. So we don't have to worry about them interacting at all with regards to unit distance because they're, they're just too far away. And then another interesting case, the, the radius of the decagon is just exactly one away from the radius of the 10 thirds gone. So we can just put in unit distances there and they can coexist as well. So finally, we have that if G is a separable edge maximal unit distance graph, then one of the three following graphs that I have shown here contains each biconnected component of G. So except for a vertices and a thin annulus of outer radius one half, it's interbounded by one minus the um, radius of the innermost polygon. And those vertices in the, in the annulus in the middle aren't particularly interesting. They don't induce any new edges on their own. So we really just care, we care most about these three um, biconnected components. So just to break these down a little bit after you've had a moment to just appreciate their beauty. In the one on the far left, moving from the inside out, we have the origin and then copies of the 15 fourths gone, copies of the hexagon, copies of the decagon, and then copies of the 15 gone. And the one right next to it in the middle, you can tell it is definitely more similar than um, either of these two are to the third one because it's almost the same graph. Instead of the um, origin and then the 15 fourths gone, here we have the origin and then the 10 thirds gone, the hexagon, the decagon, and then the 15 gone. And then here all the way on the right, we have um, the origin, the 12 fifths gone, and here we only have one copy of the 12 fifths gone, and then two copies of the hexagon, and then one copy of the dodecagon. And it looks like I'm wrapping this up just a little bit early for the last talk of the night, but that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? You can <coughs> go to the Q&A, go to the chat, or raise your hand and If not, uh, again, thank you very much. And um, thank everyone for uh, staying with us to the end of the day session. Uh, we'll be back at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, bye everyone. <laughs>